Cardinal Oscar Andres Rodriguez Maradiaga, you are the Archbishop of Tegucigalpa, Honduras. Yes. Uh, welcome to Norway. Thank you very much. One of the hot topics uh, leading up to the conclave that elected Pope Francis was the need of a reform of the Roman Curia. Uh, in April 2013, you were made head of the so-called G8, or now G9, <laughs> nine members, the group of cardinals put together by the Pope to advise him on the reform of the Curia. Um, some big changes have, has already been implemented, uh, especially on the economy. Um, how is the work going and what can we expect in the future? Well, it's uh, something interesting because this was um, a desire of most of the cardinals that were in the pre-conclave meetings. Why? Because, you know, it's not um, the first reform. There were different reforms in history. The most uh, recent ones, it was Pius X at the beginning of the 20th century, then Paul VI after Vatican II, then John Paul II in 1989, and it was necessary now because time passes and you see that uh, life changes and it's necessary also to adapt to the new circumstances. One of the, um, of the main problems was all the discussions and maybe scandals about the economy. So the Pope entrusted us to make an investigation and then uh, information about the situation of economy in the state of the Vatican. That he also appointed two different commissions that reported to us and then uh, in February this year, the Secretariat for Economy was created and uh, continue, and now it's uh, like the administration of the patrimony of St. Peter is being transformed like the central bank in uh, other in uh, civil societies. It's been a tough effort but now it's working very well. What are the future steps? We are working, collecting all the information and suggestions that comes from all the dioceses and, and even single persons in order to uh, simplify the organization of the Curia. Uh, we have been examining every dicastery and then the councils that are very many, more than 30 different offices. One criteria is this, the Pope needs to come together with his cabinet of governance. And uh, when they are so many, it's not easy to work. So this uh, criteria has been advancing, maybe very, uh, one of the most mature ideas is to create a dicastery for the lay people because you know a congregation. bishops have a congregation, clergy have a congregation, religious have a congregation, lay people are the majority in the church and they do not have, they only have a council. So in this, con this new congregation for the laity, maybe we will have a um, family in there yes. and uh, life, what is related to life. And maybe family could be uh, led by, uh, by a couple. Mm. And uh, also the criteria is that it's not necessary to have in every, in every uh, congregation lots of bishops and priests maybe lay people can serve as well. Mm. And so we go in that direction. Another congregation that may be created is the Congregation for uh, Justice, Peace, Caritas, etc. Mm. Putting inside the Council for Health, the Council for Migrants, etc. Yes, yes. And so this is more or less what is going on. Uh, 
The Synod of Bishops on the Family um, turned out to be, uh, let's say, a lively affair um, with bishops and cardinals in open uh, disagreement in the press uh, leading up to, but also during the Synod. Um, and the midterm report was the source of a lot of controversy, uh, which touched upon controversial, controversial issues such as uh, communion for the remarried and pastoral outreach to gay people. Um, I saw that your cardinal colleague, Timothy Dolan, knew from New York, uh, he called this synod you know, the antipasti, or what's to come later. <laughs> and um, I want to ask you, Cardinal, how can we make sure that we safeguard church unity in this process, uh, while also having open and frank discussions? Yes, um, what an interesting question you make. First of all, in the Relatio, after the discussion, there were 62 articles. And uh, most of the articles were approved with uh, two-thirds of the votes and more than two-thirds. But there were five or six um, articles that had trouble. It doesn't mean that they were not, or that they were rejected, no, because they got a lot of voting, positive voting, but they didn't reach the two-thirds. The Pope wants to conserve those articles and to publish the number of votes. Why? Because this was the first stage of a synod. When you see the, the method we are using, see, judge, and act, mm -hmm. um, this was the first step, to see the reality. It was controversial, but only in very few things. Of course, the press was giving a lot of publicity and saying that the union of the church is going to be broken. No, this is a false perception, because it's necessary that everybody can uh, present its own uh, points of view, but then when it will go to making a final statement, of course, is necessary to arrive to an agreement. It's not that they are going to be rejected. And uh, I would say it's, it's good to touch some controversial aspects or arguments because then reflection can come and be deepened. And this is what is going to be right now. Of course, if there is um, controversy about giving communion to the couples that have failed, uh, why and how? And how, what is a sacrament? And how the um, couple became marriage, mm -hmm. sacrament of marriage, and, and lots of things that need uh, deepen reflection. It is going to be given during this year. Yes. Many studies and and you know the final statement, this uh, relatio, mm -hmm. is going to be like the lineamenta for the new synod. We have to come back to that in our local churches and to this cause and to enrich that. Mm -hmm. So the synod was not a failure. The Synod was not a controversy. It's very interesting to read the final speech of the Pope because he is given the perception of what happened there and it's very good. I can tell you it was four minutes applause, standing ovation to his speech because, okay, he was reassuming all the work and uh, in the best way. Was there, was there kind of a synod of the media going on while at the same time, maybe? You know, the culture, the actual culture of the media is, uh, it's important in the world, but uh, they look for headlines. Mm -hmm. And when the headline is very attractive, it's better for them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think there is danger of uh, putting the unity of the church in danger. Let's talk uh, some more about Pope Francis. 
um, in many ways the Pope has uh, changed the global story on Catholicism uh, with his personal style. Um, and you have once said that uh, Pope Francis is communicating through um, uh, encyclical of, of gestures. Um, can, can you tell us a little about how Francis is changing the church? And uh, in which way does the fact that he is a Latin American affect his style and his priorities? Well, he is not uh, pretending to be who knows what. He's just acting as he always did. It means uh, being near to the people, living in Santa Marta house and not in the Apostolic Palace. This is not of a fashion, but only that he says, I need to be in contact with the people and the pontifical apartment is too far away and people enter by drops <laughs> yeah. and I need to, con to be with the people. That's why he chose to celebrate the Holy Mass in Santa Marta every day where he has around 80 persons in the chapel. This is another way he greets every single person after the Mass and talks to them and it, it's really a beautiful, beautiful uh, sign. He, then he lives in a very modest apartment and uh, he eats in the dining room with all of the guests of Santa Marta. Yes. All these things are beautiful signs. He gets energy from meeting people, being around them. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. And this is... Uh, also, his preference, he was in the conference of Santo Domingo and uh, in uh, Aparecida. So when we talk about the preferential option for the poor, it's something that the Pope has been living all his life. Mm. And so this is one of his pastoral approaches to the papacy. Uh, the social teachings uh, of the church is important for this papacy, uh, with one of the main themes being the concern for the poor, but also this critique of the so-called um, globalization of indifference. Yes. Which the Pope talks, talks yes. about. Yes. Uh, what is the church's role in fighting this indifference? Well, you know, it's necessary because the main uh, mandate of the um, gospel is to love your neighbor. You cannot be closed in your egoism. You cannot be just being indifferent. But when the, the tragedy of Lampedusa occurred, the Pope came to know that there was nothing in the press, nothing, in, and she said, I am going to visit Lampedusa. And thanks to this visit, the theme came back to the headlines and to the newspapers and people could help better. Yeah. And, and this is why he is all the time trying to visit the poorest countries. He went to, to um, Albania. Yes that seemed impossible in the past. Mm. It was the most communist of the communist countries, Albania. He will, go into, he will be going to Sri Lanka, he will go to Philippines, and they say, why Asia and not Latin America? Mm. The answer is very simple, because in Asia we have the 60% of the world's population. So even if Christianity is very small there, he has to go. He has to give signs of that. Mm. Uh, the Pope has several times criticized the free market system, um, calling it a new idolatry. Uh, but in Europe and the USA, the Pope has met some criticism uh, because of his remarks on the free market. Uh, critics, critics argue that the world poverty has actually... Uh, decreased in the last 20 years. And I wanted to ask you, uh, does uh, the social teachings of the church sometimes have a blind spot for the benefits of capitalism? I would say the problem is that the poverty 
maybe has diminished in uh, absolute figures, but uh, the reality is that poverty didn't diminish in the grassroots, in the bases. Maybe in the prosperous countries, poverty, just the rate of po po poor people was descending. But in the majority of the poor countries, poverty is increasing. So it's necessary. Secondly, because I am convinced that capitalism, especially in the last years, has become more savage in order to say that uh, equality is missing. The world, inequalities in the world have been increasing instead of diminishing. Norway is an exception because it's a country, that, a very democratic country, where equality is, is uh, a standard. I was visiting the parliament this morning and I learned that uh, the salaries of um, a representative of, to the Congress is not too high in, rel in relationship to other salaries. And this is justice, this is social justice. But uh, when, uh, when uh, an entrepreneur is winning 100 or 600 times what the workers do, this is really unjust. This is a system that ca has to change. And this is the situation that the Pope is demanding. You are currently serving your second four-year term as uh, president of Caritas Internationalis and are visiting Norway for the 50-year anniversary of Caritas Norway. Um, what are the most pressing issues for Caritas today and what are your impressions of uh, being the work being done here in Norway? Well, what I think is that Caritas is a very good instrument of love, especially for the poor. And as Pope Francis told us in our last meeting, he said, Caritas is the caress of the church to the ones who suffer, to the poor, to the needy, to the sick. Uh, we are not only talking about love, but showing love by concrete gestures, such as feeding the, those who have nothing to eat, such as visiting and praying for the ill people and uh, things like that. I am very grateful to Caritas Norway after one, uh, 50 years. They have been promoting a lot of development and humanitarian aid in many, many countries. Cardinal Oscar Andres Rodriguez Maradiaga, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. My pleasure and I wish all the best for all of you working in the media of the Catholic Church. Thank you. God bless.